We've got Jacob Brown playing a Yakov finger, and uh, a couple of excerpts of his his ambient sound arts for electronic uh, music. Like this. Some kind of 
realization of, uh, of utopia. And then obviously, as you all know, being a uh, felon space, we have uh, really as our the psychedelic community was uh, ultimately uh, repressed. And uh, I guess we're, we're now living in this, uh, this kind of like post, post modern world where people's ideas of, of utopia are kind of are kind of disintegrated. Yeah. So I guess the, the, the joyful aspect of, uh, of the 60s music kind of reflects that. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can hear hope for that. And the hope which I think that my music ultimately kind of, uh, I always try to end uh, my passages of music with, uh, with hopeful passages. And I guess that that hope is a, a different kind. It's more right. like a flame in this uh, ever increasing uh, black void. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in the cat. You, you, you heard a couple of excerpts of the music. Uh, would, you, would you bring, have you heard of a sort of darkening of electronic music over the years? Would you say that's a trend you've noticed, or is it just one of many different trends? Yes, it's a bit dark, and but it's still joyful, you know, when you, when you, when you, when you, when you do those gigs, like uh, Sister and Seven, mm -hmm. everybody is really happy and yeah. joyful. Yeah, I think well, you, you, you and Steve have kept that flame alive, really. But uh, in other quarters, it's you know there are, there are many different people with different agendas. But, um, but the the uh, the original sound art, have you had much of a chance to follow the original? Not other than dance music, have you been following electronic ambient music and other kinds? I don't really understand. Oh, um, so obviously you're very much involved with electronic dance scenes. So have you also been following the evolution of ambient electronic music. Yes, well, we, we, we were working up with your other Okay. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if we did. But, um, just a, a, a bit. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's a huge field now. There's so many people making sound art. It's impossible to know about everything. Yeah, I see. Um, but we'll move on now to, um, We've got Adam Brodigan here, he's a drummer in the band called Lapis Lazuli, one of a batch of uh, new psychedelic progressive bands uh, out of Canterbury at the moment. And he's an expert from things uh, called Incessant Creakings. <laughs> Um, I 
went to school with, and I, he was listening to a lot of Mike Patton stuff. And so I got a fan together, although I didn't really know just a bundle of quantum and sort of patterns or things like that. I think his progressive nature was absorbing <coughs> Mike Patton things. Now I'm sure Mike Patton's been well into psychedelics, although we don't know. Mike Patton, tell us who Mike Patton is. Uh, thank you, Mark. Oh, okay. Yeah, but Mr. Bungle sounds much better. Mr. Bungle, to me, is here, yeah, like, the defining moment. Very choppy and changey, and um, really, really creative. And so, that's what I was getting stumped with on this talk, was the difference between aggressive music and psychedelic music these days. Yes. Yeah. Psychedelic music was progressive, so there's no reason why progressive music and not to be psychedelic music. It just doesn't sound like it. Psychedelic style. Yeah, well, there's, there's an important distinction we were talking about this earlier. Yeah. Uh, this psychedelic music is actually made by people on psychedelics or who've recently been inspired by them. And there's people who make music, this sounds like that. So that becomes psychedelic style music. You know, those people may have never actually had the experience, they can never take the style. But this progressive thing, I mean, you're, you're kind of, I was trying to understand, referring to the sort of 70s prog rock trend. Um, well, you've got bands like Yes, uh, King Crimson, and Van der Generator, and uh, Genesis, quite, quite complex music, out of the little rock framework, using um, interesting light projections, mixing up genres, playing weird time signatures, doing all the things that psychedelia opened the doors to, but without the drugs. So a lot of those bands that I named were all quite known for being quite clean living and not being into the drug scene. And yet that scene probably wouldn't have happened if it weren't for psychedelia. So does psychedelia continue once people stop actually using the drugs to just follow those musical pathways, or does it have to be? It's just a definition, really. But this is something you struggle with when it comes to this emotion. Well, no, I like the way that it can be almost the one influences the other, influences the other, because the group of people that we are as a band now have had many psychedelic experiences and it's made us want to look at the bird's eye view of humanity as well as the arts and music. Mm. So each of our tunes can span 20, 40 minutes of going across different parts of the world, challenging different harmonic systems if we like, different rhythms which to us is pretty psychedelic. But taking people on their journey, so the music is also a psychedelic drug or... It actually acts as a psychedelic drug. Rather than us just cathartically um, getting lost in music which sounds pretty far out, we're, we actually like want other people to get lost in this stuff because we rehearse more than the gig. I mean, we're not getting the gig at the moment now. <laughs> so, so we rehearse a lot and we've been working on the 40 minute tune, which is very much trying to push the boundaries of that so people if people say they don't notice time go by when we play our 20 minute tunes I think it's sure it's only about 10 minutes that we have. Yeah and that allows people to have something like it like a experiment. So that's another role. You've got psychedelic music, which is just made by people on psychedelics. You've got the imitation of it, then you've got music made to kind of simulate that experience for people. So these are all different roles. Um, I was just going to ask Twink about um, Sid Powell, the guitarist. You mentioned one of the greatest guitarists. Um, he's best known for his work with Yes, who uh, almost defined the British 70s uh, progressive rock style. But, um, but he started off with Tomorrow, and he, he, he was a, you know, a member of Tomorrow with you, in the UFO club with all of these people taking LSD and light, liquid light shows. And then he went on to Yes, who very much renounced drug culture. Um, they were vegetarians and did meditation. And, um, uh, but they made this very ambitious music, you know, 20 minute pieces, and this very psychedelic looking artwork on, on the album covers and the concepts around it. So, would you say Steve Howe brought something to a psychedelic past into that, or what, how, did that, how did that come about? Well, I, I, I don't think that he brought um, the free form, free form experience of our psychedelic music experience mm. in his interview. Yes, he was, uh, he found himself in a very structured music, he structured and set environment. Mm. But you said he renounced all, uh, I don't think it's quite accurate. Well, maybe he didn't, but the band as a whole, were, they weren't known for being... Uh, oh, no, 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 I was talking about Steve. Steve himself. Steve yeah. liked, 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 liked a good pipe, you know, yeah. so it does. Okay. <laughs> so, it's all right, so, yes, we're perhaps in front of Chris, we don't have to do it, that's interesting. 
Um, anyway, we can talk about frog rock, but, but um, Alice, but we'll have to keep things moving. Um, now we've got uh, a very different kind of uh, folk. There's, there's, there's another branch of, um, sorry, psychic, psychedelia in Britain, which tends to get bracketed into psych folk, psychedelic folk, acid folk, and this is rooted um, more with bands like the Incredible String Band and perhaps with Donovan and certain other less known people, rather than the, the sort of rock-based Pink Floyd, Soft Machine, uh, Tomorrow with Thread. But um, Andy Lecce is on the panel here, and he's part of a group called Wad, who are playing uh, traditional music, but which is very psychedelic in nature. So he's Wad in the Ashbonian Museum in Oxford, and see if you can guess where this music's from. Sort of having our formative years in the 80s, which, as far as I was concerned, was a sort of 
black hole in musical culture. It is, it's just abominable. So I spent all my time listening to Paul Green, Gong, all that stuff from 67 to 73. Um, and it's interesting, you see, I mean, I, I, my music is very informed by psychedelic experiences, but I don't necessarily call myself a psychedelic musician. And um, I think of myself as a folk musician, or maybe a songwriter, but what I discovered in the folk tradition is uh, it's not folk song that really does it for me, it's folk tunes. And um, particularly medieval tunes and uh, the tunes of music from Brittany, very, very simple tunes, often five note tunes that are repeated over and over and over again. And um, there is this excellent tradition in Brittany of, of very simple repetitive dances, line dances, people dancing together as a community to bagpipes, shawls, sometimes percussion. And uh, I found this music sort of barbaric, but beautifully so. It, it, it does something to me in a kind of primal way. And so what we, what we do with what, we take a tune, very simple tune, and we play it until we stop playing it, which can be half an hour. Um, so you have problems getting gigs with them. Um, Rock, you've got more chord changes than we have been playing one tune for half an hour, just improvising around it and trying to find new ways into it. And um, this always happens when we rehearse, it doesn't always happen when there's a kick, but what we're aiming for is that moment of transformation where the music is playing out so I'm sure everyone here knows that. This, uh, this feeling that the tunes are playing out so we play unexpected variations and and what have you. And, and for me, um, I get excited by the fact that this may or may not be part of our indigenous music making way back. You know, we can only fantasize. Um, and looking forward as well, I mean, I don't want to be the pessimist of the conference, but I like to think that when there is no electricity, we'll still have our own indigenous trance music and we'll be doing bagpipes and early birdies and mandolins and things. So, okay. this is you, you touched on something which is uh, the, the simplicity of these tunes, the fact that there's no harmonic movement, they're mobile. And that's what I mean, Nick was talking about hearing the birds, eight miles high, which was based on Coltrane's India, which was a, it was a breakthrough in jazz because it was mobile. It wasn't, it wasn't jazz sound in the course. Yeah, it was basically just jamming on one archipelago on one scale. And is there something about the psychedelic side of mind that is open to modal music? So I'm just going to play a little, um, just to remind you that the uh, tomorrow single, um, no, the, the, from from Twig's album, Think Pink. This is a tiny piece of guitar playing by Paul Rudolph. It's something about this which appeals to the psychedelic mind, which it wouldn't have appealed to a pre-psychedelic music culture. Um, bear with me. Scale, whatever your scale you're using, 
has consonance or dissonance with that drone. And so there is a kind of instant metaphor of a journey. When you get to the octave, it's, it's suddenly a safe place. Sometimes it's really dissonant. You don't want to stay there. Um, and, and for me, when I discovered drone music, it was just like coming home. Uh, and then the drone, of course, is always unfolding, steadily unfolding. And yet, if you, if you were to play a pure sine wave on the synthesizer, it would be boring as fuck. It's just a pure time. And yet, every, if you create a nice drone on the synth, you have to have some kind of filter switch to make it interesting. And any organic, by which I mean non electronic way of making a drone, has that undulation, that oscillation. As a piper, I try and keep my drone constant, but it doesn't. It wavers ever so slightly up and down. The hurdy gurdy drone has this beautiful uh, undulation to it. Any kind of circular breathing is the same. And I think it's related to that feeling of a continuous breath. I, as I said, I could talk for hours about it, and I should have some hours. Yeah, any other thoughts on drone or modality? Mm -hmm. Like music. No, just a short thing. I mean, it, I think you pretty much all know, but it taps into something really universal. It's yeah, right. it starts to introduce you, Nancy. Nancy Yes, it's so good. We've played a couple of times in a second, but we'll hear what we have to say first. It's just, um, there's something scientifically about the way that, that um, sound waves move that is so in tune with actual natural waves and the waves that we see in, uh, let's just take the sea, for example. The way, as you watch the waves crash upon the shore, you know, if you actually look physically at a, a most drone undulating wave, like you said, there's something so in tune with the way that nature works, and I think somewhere in our brains, and normally if we're kind of contained within a, a Western system of thought, let's say, where we're used to music being a certain way, and we're used to those paradigms, Maybe it doesn't reach us, but so many cultures around the world have it in the in the traditional music. Let's say Indian music is the obvious example. But um, what they're trying to say, there's something so natural to it, so in harmony with ourselves, with the planet. I mean, the planet itself makes a giant drone. I mean, people here, scientists will know much more than I do, but we're not aware of it. But the planet itself, as it revolves, makes a continual droning sound that is beyond the perception of many of our ears. Of many of our ears, but it's actually there. I mean. So the planet we live on is making a drone all the time, and there you go. I mean, why, 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 do you, why do you think that Western culture turned away from it for, for several generations? Um... Cultures against nature. <laughs> Possibly. I'm not. I'm not entirely sure. I, I can. I can even begin. To okay. Well, I'm thinking about that. I'm sorry. That's enormous. That's just... Yeah. Um, I'll take a couple of clips from Stray Ghost, which is actually solo electronic project. Uh, this is. sing uh, uh, a very brief uh, Ikaro, uh, magic spell song um, from the um, uh, Shipibo Konibo lineage. Um, this is an area of the upper Amazon. Um, uh, Santa Rosa de Namarca, uh, my maestro, uh, shaman Antonio Vasquez Guadareta. Um, Open the plant medicine song for me so that I can use this with ayahuasca uh, to facilitate powerful healings uh, in groups of people and individuals. Um, I would also um, like to sing this to somebody um, because I can sing it to you all, and that's great. You're all going to feel the effect of this. Um, but I would like to sing the medicine song into a particular individual. Is somebody... Yes, please. Yes, please. Yeah. Um, okay. This is going to be okay. I'm going to be down here on the floor. Um, thank you very much, Renee. Hannah, hi. Hannah, hi. Blessings. I'm so happy to see you. Um, 
I've, I've got 10 minutes apparently, um, and I'd like to sing to Hannah. And when I sing to Hannah, I'm going to, um, I'm going to be singing into the uh, perfume bottle. Uh, this is the Ruda. This is um, a herb perfume, typical of the upper Amazonic. Um, the shaman sings into the perfume bottle. It infuses the perfume with um, the spirit, the, uh, the medicine spirit, ayahuasca. Um, and then the shaman literally blows the song, the power of the song, into the person that's being sung to. Um, and after I sung to Hannah, um, I, I met somebody uh, very, very briefly. Um, yes, Lorraine. Um, I met somebody very briefly who also sings from uh, another area of South America. And um, if possible, somebody can tell me when five minutes is up. Yeah, uh, give me an indication in some way. I'd like Lorraine to come down and um, actually sing with me, sing across me. In um, Quechua, is it? Quechua. Yeah, see. Okay, so we're going to have um, like uh, uh, two kinds of Ikaro coming through. Um, so thank you very much. I'm going to just sing the song now. Ton, 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 ton,
古时当宝贵，当那富，当那富。多美就爱当，不爱当，古时当宝，要么干嘛的？宝那当那贵香，宝那香，宝谁能把握？I just like to say, um, sometimes in the Shipibo uh, tradition, uh, where uh, the Maloka uh, not just has the one shaman, uh, the maestro singing, sometimes he has an entourage of shaman singing with him. Um, and it can get quite chaotic in a Maloka when you have the maestro and perhaps six or seven shaman, maestras, aneas, all singing together. They tend to sing different songs all at the same time. I'd like to just demonstrate um, how uh, the um, improbable likelihood that um, uh, two people, um, two shaman who've never met each other, <laughs> can suddenly start up so singing and perhaps create a weave that somehow creates um, a harmony that can be understood. Um, I don't have my leaves or anything with me. No, 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 that's okay. Monitor, can't 
Kuwanita po siya kundi kama Nakita ang rakata Puno takong tumaku Tinipotan na kami tumaku Kusita matito Uy tumpang kusita kumeso もういちょうこんにちょうこんたんちゅうけびこしやこんあねこいしゃこんあくんちゃんのあきらおいちょうこんのてんねおいたのとかぶいたおいちょうこんなのかじゅうさんこ Oh, oh, oh.